force or not force the uh, any religious symbol has always been a big controversial and problematic uh, system for me. Uh, I just wanted your opinion on that. It's a good question, but I really want you when you go to any uh, Muslim community and they are talking about you know condemning Burkini ban or travel ban, you also ask them if they condemn compulsory hijab as well. Because it's really important to get both sides. My mom wears hijab. My sister wears hijab. I am not against them. I am against compulsory hijab. And I am all for choice. But this is really important to make it clear that in the West now, hijab became trendy. And when we talk about compulsory hijab, we always keep you know, hearing, shh, this is not the right time. You know, I, I grew up in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a society always hearing because of the war, because of the sanction, because of the revolution, because you're poor, think about money and bread. It's not important. And now here in the West, I always hear that, you know, if you talk about compulsory hijab because of, you know, Donald Trump is around, <laughs> Islamophobia, so they might take advantage. And I always say that if you are a true Muslim, then you have to join me and millions of Iranian women and condemn anything which is happening in the name of Islam in my Muslim countries, you know? And, and uh, all the Sharia laws are against us from the age of seven. And here in the West, I never, never hear none of these you know, people who are condemning Burkini ban, condemning travel ban, saying a single word against compulsory hijab because they care about Islamophobia. But I strongly believe we are not the one causing Islamophobia. The Sharia laws, Islamic Republic of Iran, all the restrictive laws causing Islamophobia. And if you are a true Muslim who believe uh, in freedom of choice, you cannot just keep silent. I said that in European Parliament, in the eyes of those MPs who went to Iran, wore the hijab, which was really trendy and cute for them, and then they invited me to condemn Burkini ban. I said, how come? This is, this, this, is calling, this is called hypocrisy. This is called double standard. You go there, you obey the law which is violating against millions of Iranian women. And now you're saying that, you know, I'm against Burkini ban. I know I'm talkative, but I have to say that as well. There were, uh, there were the, uh, the feminists from Sweden. They, they, uh, they took a picture of themselves to mock uh, Donald Trump's cabinet. It was all female you know, cabinet. It was an amazing picture to show that, to, to tell Donald Trump that men and women are equal. It was good. Later on, they went to Iran, all those female ministers, and all of them wearing hijab, doing this, to show the Islamic Republic of Iran, well, you know, men are more equal than women. I don't believe in this kind of feminism. And I don't believe that when Muslims keep silent, True feminists keep silent against compulsory hijab. They are really fighting for freedom of choice. They are actually more care about the philosophy behind hijab, the political Islam, which really you know, bothers me. Good. Uh, I think that everything you have said is magnificent. Oh, thank you so much. Almost inspirational. You know, I'm used to hear a lot of nasty messages Massey from John, the government. Uh, Thank you so much. Massey John, this no, gentleman, um, can I just introduce you? This yes, gentleman please. is Mr. Marvin Kalb, who was the NBC correspondent. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, honestly, um, he's very, very well. Uh, he's, he's famous. Thank he's you. being very thank humble. You. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say it. Thank you very much. You're very, thank you. The question that I have, sure. at what point will it be a year, 10 years, 20 years, before your vision of Iran, which you would like to see, comes Tomorrow. into being. <laughs> Realistically, give me a, a look into the future. Look, um, Iranian politics is not, it, it's not predictable. It's like British weather. Actually, they can't predict the weather. <laughs> but um, we, we really cannot predict anything. When people took the street in 2009, nobody expected that the huge you know, demonstration took place in Iran. And um, just recently, Iran protests. Nobody, I mean, none of the um, you know, journalists or policymakers, the politicians, nobody expects that 80 cities in Iran going to involve in Iran protests. So that is why I have to say that now in Iran, 
the main issue is the survival of Islamic Republic of Iran, which was, I have to say that now because of the social media, and this time, the, the most, uh, like the, the pro-government, those people who supported the revolution, who supported the government, they became against the government. So I, I have the hope that change comes within the society, but I strongly believe if international community ignore these people, do not recognize their protest, then nothing gonna happen. You know, during the 2009 election, there was like, uh, Iranian people might know about this, there was a famous slogan about Obama. First of all, let me clear that. Obama means he is with us. U means he. Ba means with. Ma means us. He is with us. People took to the street, and then they were saying, Obama, you either with us or with them. Obama didn't take a stand because he was concerned that the Islamic Republic of Iran might take advantage and accuse um, the protesters being supported by the Western government, by American government. But let me tell you something. Two presidential challenger, those are the main pillar of Islamic Republic of Iran, are still in prison being accused of being supported by Western government. They killed more than 100 people and arrested thousands of people and accuse them that you're supported by Western government. Right now, this is happening. Again, women took to the street, people took to the street, they protested against the Islamic Republic of Iran. What happened? The member of the European Parliament went to Iran. Before the deal, the high representative of European Parliament, Catherine Ashton, when she, want, she wanted to go to Iran, she put a condition, said that, I have to meet uh, the women's rights activists and then talk about nuclear deal. And she did. But when the deal happened, after the deal, the high representative of European Parliament, Federico Mogherini, went to Iran. She totally ignored human rights activists. She just went and met the you know, uh, president of Iran, the foreign minister of Iran, no mention about human rights abuse. This is actually important to, to, to understand that. When we bury human rights under the nuclear deal, then you know, it gives power to the government of Iran to oppress the protesters. There was, um, can we give the can lady a Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Uh, my name's Shiva, Iranian-American. Um, your story really resonated with me because when I visited Iran, I actually visited it in 09, uh, was there for three months afterwards, and they pegged me for a foreigner instantly. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, I, I wore my hijab, I wore my manto and everything, but it was, how I carried myself, like my default is like I smile in the streets and gentlemen take that as an invitation to like accost you. And a lot, few times I, I was like approached and just ignored it. And I noticed that women in the streets of Iran, like they are just always kind of grimacing so that people leave them alone. And I was wondering with your movement of removing the hijab and all the connotation of like, Good this question. woman, this woman is loose, this woman is a certain way. How do we educate our like even newer generation of men? How do we get them on board with us to say no, she just again wants to feel the wind in her hair? Amazing question. <laughs> that is why I think we have, uh, we have to educate the society as well. But in defense of Iranian men, I have to say that this is happening in New York as well. Come to Brooklyn and walk like this. <laughs> Just a smile. <laughs> but I have to say that um, through social media, when people talk about it, they learn how to, you know, how to um, react to such a thing in, in the street. Um, uh, the new initiative on my White Wednesdays, um, on White Wednesdays campaign is my camera is my weapon. So women walking on wild, when they're getting sexual harassment or they're getting you know, attacked by morality police or even ordinary people who think they, are, you know, um, they have the responsible to take everybody to heaven by force, then women can use their mo mobile phone. It just happens to me when I was in London, I got stopped by a pro-government um, you know, gentleman in the airport and he called me, okay, now I'm gonna say that. Zanike Zisht, don't translate it. So, um, <laughs> You bring shame to Iran. Why? Because you're talking about you know, all the nasty thing, all the backward law, and then you bring shame to Iran? I said, no, I bring shame to Islamic Republic of Iran. 
So he was really mad. I defense, and I started to talk, and we had a serious debate. I left, and I said, "Oh my God, he called me ugly." Yeah, I, I, I you know, I talked about the politic, the political debate was went, went very well, but he called me ugly. I went back with my camera, and I said, "You called me ugly. Can you just say that on my camera?" And he said, "No, you know, man, go stop. Yani kar zesh na koi, yani zesh, zesh ma." He couldn't say that on my camera. And I said, I won the battle, you know? My weapon is to expose the violence. And he was ashamed to repeat it on the camera. So I, 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 I talk about this on my Instagram. It went viral. And it encouraged other women to do exactly the same. When men attacking them, men, when the morality police attack them, they send me videos of their reaction. And I just received a video last week, a woman sitting down calmly, challenging the morality police. You won't believe me in one day. Go to my Instagram page. She got six million views, and there was 30,000 comments. He never had the chance to talk about this in Iran. For us, this is really important. We broke the censorship, so we already won the battle. So I think this is really important. Using your mobile. Next time when you go to Iran, yes. <laughs> Hi, um, very moving, very eloquent talk. Thank you very much. Um, quick question about this, returning this idea of compulsory and versus choice. Um, you know, clearly the mullahs, conservatives um, in power want to maintain these restrictions on women's personal freedoms, including the hijab. Um, but what about women's groups, uh, tradi quote unquote traditional women, women who believe, at least from the Muslim women in Iran, that it really is compulsory, um, mandated by the Quran or Hadith. And there obviously there are there's room for interpretation. There, you know, um, my understanding is that, you know, it's not mandated by the Quran. There's an argument you can make about the Hadith and, you know, the Prophet, things like that. But I'm just curious about kind of what kind of barriers have you seen coming from quote unquote traditional women's groups to um, eliminating the requirement. این میپرسی که اون زنایی که دوست دوست دارن چهار قط بزنن و هجاب بپوشن شما را چیز کردن از اونا چه ریاکشنی داشتین from the beginning they were kind of um, angry because they didn't take it serious they thought we are you know against them yeah against yeah. them we want to make all the people naked i mean the word naked they really use it when you take off your headscarf sometimes they call you you know why are you coming out naked <laughs> so um but, but after that, we, in our movement, we always comes with new initiative to invite different you know, group of people. So I invited all women who believe in hijab, but they hate compulsory job. You know, and we created a debate about this, and it was really successful. Woman walking in the street with, his, with her son, with her chador. You know, both of them supporting freedom of choice, but they were not talking about themselves. Because the mother wearing hijab, that was a guy you know, hijab was not a matter for, for him. But this kind of debate actually helped them to understand that this is 21st century. You know, all women should be free to choose what they want to wear. I think we shouldn't make people um, tired, then they're not going to buy the book. Can we have, <laughs> we have one last question. Yeah. You got it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was this gentleman who had his hand up for a long time. That is. Was it you? Oh, I, 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 I don't gonna... feel like talking without him okay. first. So we... Oh, it's so nice of you. Thank you. Um, so uh, you, you, you spoke to uh, Foreign Minister Javad Zarif's uh, resistance to, you know, his unwillingness to acquiesce to international pressure on the issue of the hijab. Uh, from your perspective, uh, is there a way that Western governments can better pressure uh, Foreign Minister Zarif and the Rouhani administration at large into modernizing and westernizing Iranian civil society? Sometimes I get this question that how you want Western, um, especially feminists, to help you. I say that, you know, what I want is just, you know, don't do anything for us because you're always <laughs> supporting the government. How? Uh, it's unbelievable. When the for, the, for our foreign minister meets like uh, the, the female politician with such a beautiful smile, 
and all the journalists, they fell in love with him and they totally forget about you know, the, the, the main issue which is about you know, him, human rights. And he can easily, easily lie and the journalists say, thank you so much. So how can I ask them to help us or put more pressure on, on, on him when they are not even clear about the issue? That is why I rely on our own people. When he lies, then people get together and expose the lie. Then, you know, I myself, when I photoshopped him, I was really scared that I'm gonna get attacked by, you know, so many people. But that was the people. There were so many men joined us and wearing hijab, and it was everywhere showing Jawad Zarif in hijab, you know, in like Channel 4, like BBC, all the media in France, in Germany. And so what was the result? I thought Jawad Zarif next time is not gonna lie, but he did. That is why I say that we rely on people. Instead of begging him to give us our right, women just taking off their headscarf in public through their civil disobedience. You know who equated uh, women asking for you know the right to wear or not to wear the veil to people in the West going to McDonald's without oh yes without that, their that's clothes what I said yeah, yeah. So, so that's um, but they can do better yeah like um, Marisha Schake, one of the member of European Parliament I uh, send a letter to her. And I ask her when you know when you want to go to Iran, you have to understand that this among of people, uh, 3.6 million women, got arrested and warned and sent to the court just because of not wearing, you know, appropriate hijab. They were not even unveiled. So I informed all of the female uh, member of the parliament, European Parliament. I sent all of them letter with all the statistics, and um, they were saying, you know. We want to solve so many bigger problems. We care about human rights. I said, hey, if they don't even let you to control you know, your head, then the government are not going to let you to control what's going on in your head. When they're not going to let you to you know, make a decision about your own body, then they're never going to let you to make decision about bigger problems in the Middle East. So Marich Eskaka went to Iran. And then she was there meeting Larry Johnny, meeting the foreign minister and Jawad Zarif. She wore her hijab the way that she saw in the street. And she said, oh, this is normal. I'm going to wear like this. So her neck was too you know, revealing, sexy. Mm -hmm. And then she got attacked. Before she arrives in Belgium, she was attacked. She was everywhere on the media attacking her that her hijab was not enough. And then Karen Pierce, the ambassador of United, uh, the UK ambassador at the United Nations, she went to Iran, so she respect the culture of Iran, so-called. And then uh, Jawad Zarif pointed her like this, just cover, you know, wear it properly. So this is, you know, this is, I never ask any female politician to come and liberate us. I ask them to stand up for their own dignity. This is my way of just telling them that, you know, you're just misrespecting yourself. You better understand that you, uh, you, uh, by legitimizing a law, you're putting more pressure on women, but most importantly, you just, you know, you're against your own dignity. First thing that our government come here, they ask all the Western government to remove alcohol beverages from any official dinner. Why? Because they stand up for Islamic values. Why shouldn't we stand up for human rights values? And another thing, if the West comes with a new law saying that all the female politicians from Iran, when they come here, they have to take off their hijab, what are they going to do? <laughs> they resist. They never say that, oh, OK, this is the culture of the West. Oh, this is required by law. We have to respect the law. Slavery used to be legal. A bad law should be broken. <laughs> they are happy now. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, Azar Nafisi. No, you know, Masi John, I, um, I usually try not to get emotional when I come to a meeting like this. But I am allowing myself, I'm wallowing in emotions. And, and thank you. Thank you so much. All through your speech, uh, two things came to my mind. One was a memory from Iran. Uh, when Ayatollah Khomeini died, it was early in the morning, and we were all in our living room. And my daughter was uh, very young. She was about four or five. And she kept running to the window and then coming back and running to us. And then she turned to me and said, mom, mom, he's not dead. The women are still wearing their scarves. Oh. And, yes, and, I thought, yeah, and I thought, you know, what is it in a woman 
that makes a man die, I mean, his life depends upon whether I wear my scarf yeah, or, or not. not. And that is what you gave us today. The fact is that hijab is not just about tradition or culture or religion. It's about freedom of choice. And the fact is that for you, one other thing that you did today, which I'm very thankful for, is the fact that, um, you know, these issues always come out only as political issues. And they brand one. Uh, you talked about being branded. I have been called, uh, you yeah. know, all sorts of things. Uh, uh, but the fact is that you made the issue not a political one, but an existential one. The fact that for a woman like you or like me or for any other woman, whether they wear the hijab or not, when someone else tries to impose their image of what we should be like, they're killing us, literally killing us. They, they, we hate ourselves. We deny and negate ourselves. And I'm so proud. Thank you. I'm so proud of sitting here, <laughs> listening to you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, my love. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Oh, mercy, thank mercy. You. My, you, you were my hero, you're still my hero. No, and thank I'm you not. so I'm much for... But I'm not a hero, but you... But I'm I always say to, the, to, to, to women in Iran that never make people hero, be your own hero. Yeah. But we always have something in our heart, you know, from your from our childhood. We cannot we cannot deny it. Thank you so much. خیلی دوستتون دارم. ممنونم از همه تون که اومدین. یک دنیا برام میارزه. از در که مدام تو کتم یعنی همه برام اومدن. And that means a lot to me because you know, as I said that I was the listener when I was in, in Iran. And when I was um, in Women in the World Summit, there were like 3,000 non-Iranian women. I was showing them my the picture of my brother and the picture of my mother. And um, my brother just sent me a text and said, I cannot believe that I am there with my pyjama up there. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said to, um, to my brother that, you know, this is really important because I used your story to encourage many men around me. Because I said that when you're really looking for a change, look for, for, for a close ally. We are not against men. When you find your, you know, your ally among, uh, in, within the society, in your family, then you win. Because the government always want to use men to oppress women. We have to break this barrier, and we have to get together. And I used Ali, and I ruined his freedom as a child because he was little. Oh my god, I want to say everything now. He was little, he was, he was little, he was not allowed to go and jump in, on the river on his own. He, he had to go with my older brother. But he used to do that a lot when my mom, you, you know, used to have a nap after, after lunch. And then I said, Mom, Ali is not around, Ali is not around. So when Ali came back, my mom punished him. The day after, he, he was like begging me, don't ruin my freedom. I said, no, if you want to go there, you have to take me with you. If not, Teach me how to ride a bicycle. I don't want to stay behind the curtain. Now in Iran, this is the time. Don't only ask the government to give your right back. Ask your brother, your husband, your father, why they go to, to the stadium when their daughter, sister, mothers, you know, getting bitten up behind the door. I don't understand that. We need a lot of Ali. You know, that is, that is I always use my personal story. Thank you for encouraging us, millions of Iranian women to tell you know, their personal story and use it to, uh, to make awareness. Thank you. Thank you.